Okay, so um, Holger Brand is, um, he spoke at the Kotlin Conf in 2017 about uh, scripting. And um, at the time it was uh, a pretty, I would say, um, new things. And um, he has been working on this, uh, let's say, a cool project of his, a case script um, that was aiming of bringing uh, Kotlin, a statically typed language, into the scripting world. And he managed to gather, I guess, I would say so much uh, like uh, attention and um, uh, curiosity in the community that at the end also JetBrain officially uh, decided to put uh, some, some effort on it and like shape the, the, the scripting support, let's say for Kotlin and polish a little to make it like more, um, to make it cooler. And um, yeah, uh, that's it, the, the stage is your, go ahead, Holger. Oh, thank you. Let me share my screen. Thanks, Giuseppe, for the kind introduction. Uh, I will try to share the correct screen, which is screen two. Let's see if this works. Uh, let's put it into presentation mode. All right. I hope you can all see my uh, presentation. Can you? Perfect. Thank you. Won wonderful. So, yeah, uh, thank you uh, a lot, Giuseppe, for, for making this presentation, this talk possible today. So I think, uh, yeah, we had some... Uh, discussion before about what to present today. And yeah, so we try to, uh, I mean, not just present scripting and technical automation here, but since your institute is uh, so much uh, involved and so much into understanding complex systems and their behavior, I thought we could also, I mean, uh, make, it a bit, make it a bit wider and rather talk about uh, how I experience and how uh, we in, in my current environment try to uh, understand and model more complex systems. Uh, but for sure, on the other hand side, I also uh, want to take you on a journey from this early days on, which Giuseppe just mentioned, where Kotlin was just uh, being released for the first time to the community and how uh, the community had picked it up and actually evolved it into also a tool for, for data science problems. And yeah, so I would like to talk about uh, how to bring data automation and modeling together, and in particular, how to do this with a language called Kotlin, which I guess quite a few of you may have not heard about yet. But I think that's also the intent of today's workshop to uh, give you some ideas about what it is and what we can do with it. Feel free to interrupt at any time. So, I mean, uh, for sure, I will talk uh, more or less uh, without breathing. Uh, but uh, if you have some question, please interrupt me. I mean, I think we should also try to make it more as an open discussion format than uh, like, like a, um, I mean, uh, like a lecture format. So please, yeah, feel really uh, invited to ask if something is unclear or you want to uh, get uh, go into some details. Uh, before diving into some technical bits and pieces, uh, allow me to introduce myself a bit better. So I started around 2010 uh, by doing a PhD thesis uh, at the University of Bielefeld in collaboration with Honda Research, uh, where I built a system, a, a, an AI system that allows a humanoid robot to bootstrap its own language representation, which was a fascinating project. And uh, I, mean, I was really in love with my thesis project, it was really so much fun. And uh, I really took those ideas and those methods uh, then into my first job uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genomics in Dresden, where I um, researched how cells form tissues. And this was also a great time for myself. I stayed there for uh, 10 years, so it was really an amazing time. And I was uh, uh, very honored to participate in many different research projects over there. And I learned a lot about the, the necessities uh, dealing uh, that come with complex systems, because then you have so many different heterogeneous data sets which you need to bring together. The question about causality comes into the game. So how do you deal with that? How do you actually run an analysis at scale? How do you include supercomputing and so on? So I really learned a lot during that time. And after a solid 10 years, I then moved on uh, into industry because I thought, okay, it's time to just do something different uh, because it's fun to do something different once in a while. Uh, so I moved from uh, basic research into industry and I joined a company called Systema, which is mainly about uh, process automation and optimization. And we will talk about uh, later what, what I'm doing there and how this relates to our today's topic. Um, uh, during that time, I mean, starting around 2015, uh, 
I also explored this a technical landscape a bit more broadly. Before I was using the standard tools like scripting, like in Bash, uh, which was very common in bioinformatics, like Perl and R and Python and so on. But uh, I had some prior experience at Honda uh, with more object-oriented languages. And I always felt that this a more scripting approach is the script driven approach with untyped languages felt yeah, somehow inefficient and sometimes even not suitable to model more complex systems. So uh, I was also exploring other possibilities and along this way, a couple of projects uh, emerged. I mean, the first one was K-scripts and later came Krangel, Krevels and uh, one of the more recent incarnations is a project called Kalazim. And uh, I did other stuff on GitHub, but I, I mainly want to focus on those four today in this presentation. So let's start by diving into uh, late 2015, uh, when uh, a new programming language was released, it was called Kotlin, and uh, it has evolved greatly since then. So I just grabbed this screenshot from the website uh, a couple of days ago. So it defines itself, uh, okay, that's a bit marketing heavy, but it defines itself as a modern programming language that makes developers happier. It at least makes me happier. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I think what's more important here is that it's a, a language which, which is designed to be multi-platform. So it doesn't compile against a single interpreter or runtime, but it's actually designed in a way and it ships with different compiler backends. So you can compile it into native code if you really want to go uh, close to the bare metal. You can compile it into JavaScript. You can compile it into bytecode. So there's different ways to compile it. And it's very popular to, for Android application development, but also for, for front end and server side development. And uh, I'm actually not so much into Android. I mean, I have a mobile for sure, but I don't do any application development. And I also don't do much on the server. But what I mostly cared about when I heard about the language is, um, can I actually use it to do more data science things? Uh, and so I looked for the feature list, which was promoted at the time in February 2016. And there were so many exciting things here, which I liked from the start, like it shipped with type inference, extension functions, uh, very nice constructs to define data classes. It was really designed with DSL design in mind. Uh, had default parameters, had some scripting support, and it really also solved some of the the, um, uh, the, the problems which I saw with regular data science tooling. For instance, dependency management. I still I think it's still a pain. I mean, you have these pip environments or conda environments, but they are not as evolved as a Gradle file, like the, the, the way you define dependencies in Java. So it's, I think there's a huge difference in convenience when you compare how dependencies are managed in different languages. And what I also liked in comparison to more traditional data science tool uh, languages was the scaling approach because it's a statically, statically typed language. I can scale more complex uh, domain models much easier compared to a scripting uh, approach. Like if I don't know about type so I think it becomes really hard to go beyond a certain scale uh, uh, when designing or when building a system. What I also loved about it is it's very teachable. So I did some quite some data science teaching uh, um, at the different institutes I was working. And so I've, I've not just teached computer scientists, but uh, I teach biologists, chemists, physicists. And uh, so I think I have some idea at least what what, uh, the, what, what an audience can ingest through uh, within a one or two day workshop. And I think Cotton is actually the potential to be also teach to non-technical audiences. And what I also loved in particular was its ability to uh, enable rapid prototyping. So from a language perspective, it really looked promising. So I thought, okay, it's uh, from a technical perspective, it's all there, but can we, can we do data science with it? And so I looked into the common process uh, unfortunately, I didn't find the source for the figure. Please excuse that. So there should be some source here, but yeah, I couldn't, I didn't manage to find it. But uh, the important bit here is the process. So the data science lifecycle, I think, independent of the business domain, it's uh, always coming to a couple of elements. So first, we need to get into our data into the system. We need to clean it up, tidy it, transform it model and visualize it. And at the end, we need to communicate our findings. And in Python and R, there's some highly evolved uh, set of libraries that allows, uh, which allows to do so. But on the JVM and Kotlin in particular, at the time when I was starting to deal with it, there was barely nothing. And so I 
thought, okay, let's try Vanessa nevertheless because the language looks so cool. And I wanted to throw in small bits and pieces just to get started. So I thought, okay, I do lots of bioinformatics at the time. So can I replace some of my Bash scripts, for instance, with, with Kotlin? Because yeah, I know Bash, but it always was sometimes a bit tricky. So I thought, oh, let's give it a try. But unfortunately at the time, the scripting component in the language was not so evolved. So I created a small program. Uh, it was a Bash script at the beginning, and later on, I, it was rewritten into a Kotlin script itself that extended scripting support for Kotlin. It came up with some features, like it did some caching, did internal dependency resolution, had some declarative way to de uh, declare dependencies, came with some configurability and some, some additional tooling to make uh, life a bit easier. And for sure, I could imagine there are some hardcore techies beyond uh, in, in the audience today which will ask the question, why on earth is he using something like Kotlin for scripting? Don't we have Bash? And I want to quote the unknown colleague here, uh, it's Bash is faster and way shorter. So let's just do it in Bash. And I actually also did so. So I also managed to do magical things in the terminal without anything like, like Kotlin. So here's one of my masterpieces of my uh, last career at uh, CBG in Dresden. So there was a great research project together with Marta Floria and many other great colleagues where I was uh, doing some bioinformatics. It was a, it was a wonderful project. We researched uh, uh, the, the human genome to really find those genes that enable humans to grow a bigger and a folded brain. And within this project, uh, I had to deal with so-called sequencing data. And uh, in order to do so, I've written this small masterpiece called remove Multimappers, which is a bash function. And I mean, it's very short. It's just three lines. You can see it stream. It allows to stream data through it. It worked well. It managed, uh, I mean, it supported uh, the paper. So we managed to publish the whole thing in science. But uh, in retrospect, uh, I'm not really proud of it because it falls short in many regards. I mean. It was kind of fast to write because it was a one-liner, but it's almost impossible and to maintain and to evolve. And to be honest, I have no freaking idea what it does uh, after this couple of years. So I have no clue at all. So it does not scale. It's some, in my opinion, some unteachable black art. So uh, that's for sure not what I want because I'm, I now really feel sorry in retrospect that the colleagues at the CBG now have to live with this piece of legacy code which is not fun and yeah, which probably they have to rewrite sooner or later. So what we, what I want, and I think uh, this is also shared by many uh, colleagues in the Kotlin community, is something more structured. And this is essentially what, what K-Script provides. So it provides a statically typed environment with full IDE and library support. So the way it works, just to give you a brief example, is you declare as in a best script, the scripting interpreter at the top. Uh, we say, okay, bin and please use case script to interpret the script. Then we can declare any uh, Maven central dependency. So we can really consume everything which is out there in the JVM ecosystem, which is a lot. And then we can simply start doing some scripting and we get full uh, IDE support. And as you can see by using libraries here, we don't rely on uh, standard in and standard out processing, but, can, but, but you can really use structured parsers and types to deal with the data. And clearly this is something which is way more uh, maintainable compared to the best solution we've seen before. And yeah, this was a, 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 a vague idea at the beginning uh, when, when I started this project, but actually quite some people liked it. And uh, the first one or two years I was doing most of the development, but since then I actually haven't written a single line of code because it's all coming from the community. So there's actually people still out there, uh, uh, I mean, thinking about um, ways to improve K-Script and uh, all I'm doing at the moment is aligning the PRs and doing some, some release once in a while. And it has grown into some nice interpreter, I think. So there's different ways to ingest the script so they can come from URLs, from some local pipe, from files, from the terminal itself. There's uh, quite a, a different ways to configure the scripts and their runtime behavior. 
It comes with some support API to mimic set, grab, and, uh, um, and Perl-like uh, abilities. You can uh, also quickly get a wrapper. You can bootstrap an IDE environment just from a script. You can even, uh, I never thought of this in the beginning, but this was also just contributed from the community. You can deploy scripts as standard standalone binaries, and you can even embed case scripts uh, the installer of KScript into a script itself and so on and so on. So it has been quite a journey. And if you want to read more about it, yeah, I've uh, inlined some, some links here. I will also for sure, I, I, many, I missed uh, to um, um, point this out at the beginning. I for sure will also share the presentation afterwards on GitHub, I guess. So if you want, you can also look this up later. And so yeah, so there are more references in case you have questions about KScript. And with KScript, I, I think I had the first puzzle piece for myself to uh, use Kotlin and to use the structured approach to scripting uh, to really support maintenance and to uh, about support better engineering to, uh, to use this in my daily work. But clearly as much as wasn't doing anything about data or data science. So I then really took one step back and thought, okay, if I have to go to a lonely island, which library would I take with me? And it's not case script for sure, because as a data scientist, I care mostly about data. And I thought, okay, do I want something like the modeling stuff like TensorFlow or God knows what? But in the end, it all boiled down to an R library called Dplyr. I said, if I really would need to pick one, and I think that's the question, I cannot take two libraries, but I really has to have to take one. I would take Dplyr because it's really the most evolved grammar for data manipulation, which is in my opinion out there. I mean, I know other libraries like Pandas and so on, but in my opinion, this is by far the most evolved system to, to deal with tabular data. And so this is what I would take to the Lonely Island. But if the Lonely Island is the Kotlin Island, I cannot do much with the library there because it won't run there. So I thought, OK, uh, how can I go to the island and still use something like Dplyr? So I browsed the internet and I found some great libraries. but. Uh, in the end, yeah, they all fall, fell short in one way or another. Uh, so I couldn't use them or didn't want to use them. So I thought, okay, let's just try it myself. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an experiment. It's still an ongoing experiment. Let's uh, simply try to build an own API where I can uh, rebuild more or less Dplyr, but for Kotlin. And that's essentially what I did. And yeah, I put it on GitHub. It also gained quite some traction. And I have also uh, uh, I mean, regular discussions with users about how to make it better. So I think it's also an, an, an interesting uh, API experiment as of now. And the way it has been built is really, uh, I took the cheat sheets. I guess you all guys know the cheat sheets from whatever you want to use a new tool, you go for its cheat sheets. So I took the deep layer cheat sheets, it was four pages. And then, then I really uh, checked them off one by one and it re-implemented those bits and pieces that define the deep layer ecosystem in Kotlin. And this worked surprisingly well. I was actually uh, surprised that we could uh, map such a scripting API into a, a statically typed uh, domain. And to give you some examples, uh, let's just dive into how we can, I mean, define data frames like tab tabular data. We can simply write it in, into the code, but for sure it also comes with many utilities to read it from various sources like from CSVs and databases and JSON and God knows what, you can scrape the web. And so there's different ways to get your data into the system. And uh, more importantly, it then really implements the entire Dplyr uh, syntax to manipulate, aggregate uh, data. So here's an example where we have flights data. We can group those flights by date then we can select a couple of parameters using some support API to support ranges, reg access, negative, positive selection, and, and quite a few more. And with this reduced data, we can then summarize um, uh, the, the data uh, by calculating the mean uh, arrival de uh, delay and the mean departure delay. And I think it looks pretty much the same as in Dplyr for sure. I mean, some of the, the, the coding style is a bit different, but the, the, the general look and feel is almost the same, except for the vectorized operators, like the GT is not pretty and the OR is not pretty. And this is something uh, we could not, or we still cannot overcome uh, with the current language uh, design. Uh, one, one very important element here was uh, that in, in more uh, data science languages like in pandas or when I use Dplyr, 
uh, it's all tables. So, and this is quite in contrast to what we do in more structured higher level languages. So let's just give me, uh, let's give you an example. So if you consider a class called employee and we have a list of those employees and then we do stuff with them. Like we predict the number of sick days, we calculate performance metrics and we do other stuff. We always essentially create a new type. So we cannot add this information to the employee data structure because there's simply no space in it for, uh, for it. And uh, this for sure, even with such a simple analysis, uh, we create quite a few types here, which makes the whole thing a bit uh, yeah, hard to maintain because now I would have five types already. So uh, in R or Python instead, it's much, it seems much more fluent because we always start with, uh, with as a table and then we can do stuff. We join and mutate and select. And we simply extend the table or reduce the table with more attributes without defining uh, additional types. And I think this uh, contrast is also, I think what makes a big difference here because users and, and colleagues, they love this uh, approach be, uh, down here because it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, the entry barrier is much, much lower. You don't have to think about types and structures. You just, I mean, you just go. And uh, to support a similar experience, uh, uh, we then added type support for, for um, Krangel, so there's this data uh, table library in Kotlin, so that the user can now mix structured and unstructured data in a table. So just to give you an example, we could consider this employee table where we have in one column actually an object, an employee object, and another one we could even have a more complex structure like a list of sales. And uh, for sure, we also will have more and more basic attributes like the salary as a double and the address and so on. And the beauty uh, of this uh, API, uh, which we have now, is that we can arbitrarily go back and forth between this object-oriented uh, um, representation and this table representation. So there's a method called as data frame in the library, which uh, is defined for every iterable. So whenever you have a collection of something, you can say, please give me a data frame. And you can also go way uh, the other way. So if you have a, a data table, you can also reparse it into a, um, a structured uh, a list of structured objects. And with this, uh, I think we really build a beautiful bridge between this object-oriented domain and the more uh, table-shaped um, domain, which is very common and very useful and uh, often is the best approach when dealing with data. Um, yeah, so there's also some bits and pieces in the, in the uh, library design which we could not solve until now. So the first thing is that, uh, yeah, the API is still cumbersome and in quite some cases, I, I actually get confused when, when, when using it uh, once in a while. And I think it all boils down to the lack of uh, vectorization in the Kotlin language design. So it's not really possible at the moment to provide uh, complete vectorization across all operators which makes it uh, really hard to, to uh, implement a deep layer or pandas like API here. But uh, yeah, I think that's also something which is in progress. So uh, yeah, I don't want to bore you with the roadmap, but for sure there's still quite a few things which we could do here to make uh, the user experience uh, even better, including better date support, uh, better bindings to other libraries and uh, what, what I also love about deep layer is that you can plug in different backends like it the uh, SQL database, so for sure we could also think about uh, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so this is basically the data side. Uh, so with this Krangel library, uh, I managed to build a system in the beginning all just for myself, but obviously some guys are interested as I saw on GitHub and for, for, from what I've also learned from the various discussions uh, that this is, uh, is of general interest, but it's just one additional piece in the puzzle because the second very important aspect here is it's not sufficient to just get into the data and do stuff with it, but you always need some visual uh, uh, way into the data. And I'm really a, a big fan of the grammar of graphics here published by Leland Wilkinson in 2005, where they stated, or I mean, came up with the idea that every plot can be generally designed as a list of aesthetics, so mappings from visual to data attributes plus some layers, plus a coordinate system, plus some uh, transformations, plus some faceting. And this may sound a bit abstract, but uh, indeed you can build all these plots, which, which you can see alpha out here in the background uh, using this uh, very consistent um, API approach, which has been 
implemented in one of the most famous R libraries called ggplot. And if I remember right, I think ggplot itself also has been ported to Python with some other name, which I don't recall here. But it has been a hugely successful um, approach to uh, data visualization. So I thought, okay, if we, if we are really serious about data science in, in Kotlin, we should also have something similar. So I started another API experiment and I tried to mimic what we can do with ggplot, but uh, using uh, Kotlin. I called the thing Crevis, which is the Kotlin grammar for data visualization. And the way it works uh, is surprisingly similar to how you uh, visualize data with R. So you have your data, you do some table manipulation, like you can add a column uh, here, it's REM proportion, which we calculate for some data for, for uh, about sleep behavior. And in the next step, we really call this function called plot, where we map columns of our data uh, set onto visual attributes, namely the X, the Y, the color, and the size. And then we define what uh, geometries we want to uh, put in here. We configure the plot uh, by uh, defining the, the, the way the guide is shown and also to, to add some title. And with just this tiny bit uh, piece of code, we can build a very interesting visualization that uh, correlates the REM proportion to the sleep total time. Uh, and uh, also details out the food preference of the individual species being analyzed here. Yeah. So this looked very promising to me. And we also took it sorry, one step further and explored if you can use not just this tabular approach for data visualization here, but if you could do the same thing, but using uh, a strongly typed API. And in fact, it's also possible. So if you would consider our sleep patterns to be a list of structured objects, we can do more or less the same thing the only difference is here that uh, when mapping visual to data attributes, we use uh, so-called, um, I mean, I think it's some kind of method reference uh, to indicate uh, what to visualize on what axis. And this yeah, worked surprisingly well. So I really like it. I still use it. Uh, and uh, the underlying architecture, I think that's uh, yeah, the only messy part because what we do here uh, is uh, in fact, we take, we build a Kotlin API and under the hood, we map it into a ggplot R call. We run R to build the visualization, which we then present to the user via different um, backends. And this works. I mean, we can also externalize R if we want. We can Dockerize it. So there's different backends to support this uh, architecture. But for sure, it's not really pretty because you always rely on R being installed on the on the user system, which is not always the case. So since uh, I've started to work on Travis, uh, other members of the Kotlin community stepped in and created another library, which is called Let's Plot, or oh, it's not Plots, but Plot, sorry for the typo. Uh, which is, I think, a more modern alternative because it really removes the annoying dependency on R and it, uh, it chips with some alternative rendering engine. I don't know its technical internal details, but it's something which is more Kotlin native, so there's no uh, native binary dependencies here. Uh, and I think, yeah, it's it's evolving greatly. I think compared compared to Crevis, it has some more limited uh, support for geometries and customizability, but it's really picking uh, up, up uh, quickly. So I think this is really great to see uh, there's an the ecosystem to emerge so well here. All right, I think it's always good to bring in some cute animals uh, because if with all this code, I think, yeah, the audience gets bored quickly. So Let's just look for 10 minutes now at this lovely cat, but we can also short, uh, shorten it to 10 seconds. It's a lovely cat and it's not just a cat because it's always good to show cute cats in presentations, but because I want to actually walk together with you through small analysis or where uh, I have analyzed mammalian sleep patterns using the machinery, which uh, I've just discussed. So let's uh, uh, open it and... Here it comes. Um, so it's a Jupyter notebook. Uh, will also be in the show notes later on. And I guess most of you guys know Jupyter. It's some uh, web-based uh, um, framework to explore or to build data science workflows. Probably there's a better definition, but uh, that's essentially what you do. You have your browser window, and then you can interactively build uh, a workout and analysis. And with the, the tooling, which we have just discussed, you can now do this in, in Kotlin as well. So here we have the, some kind of introductory documentation. And then what we do is we pull in a dependency. So we say, okay, we want to use Krangle, which is this table library 
so we simply pull it in and we can also use this let's plot library, uh, which we can also pull in. Then we can have some description here about blah, 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 what we want to do. And then we dive right into the data and we are looking into a data set called a mammalian sleep data here, which is one of the famous teaching data sets in, 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 in data science, I think. So it's 83 records where we have different species, including their sleep behavior. So we know how long they sleep, how long they dream, uh, how long they are awake, their brain wise, their body wise, so we know their order and their food preference. And we also know uh, some uh, taxonomy uh, information about how these uh, species are organized. And with this data, we want to, uh, I mean, we want to analyze those data to really understand how the different species differ from each other and whether there are some common trends and patterns. So what we can do with the API now, we can uh, simply, as we can do in R and Python, we can simply get an idea about uh, some of the rows without showing everything. We can uh, peek into the schema to see what types and what columns we have and to, to see some examples for each attribute. And then we can, uh, use uh, some, some deep layer pandas like operations to add new columns. Here we calculate the REM proportions to so the proportion of sleeping time where the animals are sleeping. And uh, yeah, then we can uh, look into that. We can then start to visualize this. I mean, if you just say, take the data and plot it, there's nothing because uh, yeah, uh, according to grammar of graphics definition, we did not add any layer. So we can do so, we can say, let's map uh, some of the attributes to the X, one other one to the Y, and then we do a, a correlation analysis to see uh, how those uh, attributes are correlated. And as you can see here, there's no striking correlation pattern between those two attributes. We can then refine this plot and uh, map further attributes to our data. For instance, we could bring in the, the food preference to see whether the food preference uh, in this correlation plot allows us to get some more insight. And here already we see some pattern like the herbivore uh, they uh, tend to sleep the least uh, uh, um, compared to the rest of the population. And by doing so, we can really work our way into the uh, library. And it's, uh, as I said, because of this grammar of graphics approach, it's a very consistent user experience uh, when it comes to building visualizations. So if you want to build a histogram, it's exactly the same process. We map some of the data attributes onto visual attributes, and then we declare what type of geometry we want to use here. We can use the same pattern to also uh, compare distributions, like here we would do a box plot, and we can also layer this. So we could, can put stuff on top of the box plot. This doesn't look so pretty yet because all the points are aligned on the on the on these axes, so it's a bit overplotted. But you can jitter them a bit artificially, and then we can nicely already see how the different um, uh, subpopulations uh, compare to each other. And we also see that the box plot is potentially not the best tool here because like in the insect D, we have very few data points. So the box plot gives kind of a false impression of what's, what's going on uh, in, the, in the distribution here. And yeah, with this approach, we can then really work uh, our way through the data and really understand what's going on. And in case we struggle with one of those libraries, what we can also always do, let's jump ahead a bit. We can also bring in another library, like here I can pull in this Travis library, which we have just discussed and use some methods and tooling, which is available only there and just reuse the same data, but in a slightly different way. And we can then also do some basic modeling where we try to fit some regression model for our data and so on and so on. So to recap this uh, small analysis, uh, what we have now is an ecosystem where we can bring data conveniently into a, a very data scientist friendly environment, which is the Jupyter um, environment. And then we can use this API to analyze and to visualize data. And let's, let's jump back to the presentation. Um, so... So uh, for sure, there's a lot of a lot of more things to tell here, and I've tried to compile a couple of pointers uh, on this intermediate uh, summary. So uh, for sure, there's a wonderful page on the kotlinlang.org page, uh, which gives you tons of uh, pointers into the, the ecosystem itself. Uh, you could also follow up on Kranger. There's a 10 minutes uh, tutorial, also also some tutorial about data manipulation. There's also quite some cool talks, the most recent one by Roman Belov uh, in the last Kotlin Conf in 2019. And the most active, and I think also the, the best place to start in case you have questions or you want to do something, 
is usually the Kotlin uh, Slack channel. So there are multiple channels, the data science and the science channel. But for sure, you can also always approach all the, the library uh, makers and, and contributors on, on GitHub via the corresponding trackers. So I think it works pretty well and it's a very friendly and uh, open-minded community. The question for sure now for me is, uh, is uh, so have you really exploited the platform to its full extent? So is this all we can do with Kotlin or can we potentially do better or can we actually do something which we could not do in R or Python? And actually, yes, I think there is because we really haven't used the full power of this statically type language to describe and to model a more complex system. So we really stayed on the table level so far, which we try to, uh, uh, I mean, mimic, um, we, we try to mimic a workflow which we, have, which we are using in other languages like R and Python, but we are not really going beyond that uh, here yet uh, because, yeah, uh, this was not yet in the scope, uh, but for sure we can and we should do so. And in particular, if uh, problems uh, grow more challenging, I think we also need something more structured. And luckily in my current position, I have uh, lots of these very complex problems. So as I said in the beginning, I've joined a company called Systema, where we deal uh, in particular with digital transformation and smart manufacturing. And I personally spend a huge chunk of my time uh, uh, supporting our customers to optimize their manufacturing processes. And we define optimization here really as, as the art of maximizing manufacturing efficiency through code OE yield and quality. And it's a complex process because it all starts with uh, digitization, monitoring, and then we need to analyze what's going on to then iteratively refine the process to make it better. And uh, this is a challenging uh, domain because manufacturing uh, has many different actors that contribute to the process. So we have the equipment, like the tools on the shop floor. We have the processes and their definitions, which are also dynamic to quite some extent. We have the people on the shop floor and in management and in logistics. We have the material, which has changing properties in time and always changing environment. And for sure, we also have the management. So there's this very complex interplay of human machine and material and methods. And it's not always following intuition. And as you can imagine, I think pretty well, we cannot map this into a table. So I think there's a regular approach in data science where I have a couple of tables and then I try to derive some insights from it. I mean, this works to some extent, but it's not uh, solving the problem here because what we need to actually do is we need to start going to the factory or to manufacturing process. And then we start need to start analyzing what's happening there. And analysis for sure relies on data in the first step. So we really need to get an idea about what they do, how often do they do it, what's their throughput and so on and so on. But uh, it's not sufficient to just look into the data because we also need to capture the dynamics and we need to uh, unravel the rules that drive a production process. And this clearly is not captured by just tabular data. I think for, for doing this, we also need to think about to capture these rules in silico to really rebuild the factory in silico in some kind of generative way. Because once we have done so, we can then start, uh, I mean, figuring out those knobs which we need to tune in order to improve the manufacturing process. And we once have, we- I'm yes, sorry, sure. we have Giuseppe asking a question. Giuseppe? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to ask you, uh, what kind of clients uh, do you have? Uh, um, what's your target? Uh... Yes, I, I will come to this in a second. Uh, it's a different industry and the focus is on semiconductor, which I think uh, is a good choice in particular here in the Dresden area. Uh, and I will, I will come to this in a second. Mm. Uh, Please yeah. continue. Yes, thank you for the question. Please feel always welcome to interrupt. I mean, I think it's it's quite a rush today. Uh, so if something is too quick or unclear, let me know, and then I will slow down and yeah, uh, go a bit deeper. Um, yes. So we need to rebuild the factory in the computer. And it's not just about data analysis, but it's really about modeling the rules and modeling the production processes themselves. And once we have done so, we can figure out some way to optimize the process, which we can then carefully bring into the real process. 
And uh, in order to realize this iterative approach shown here, uh, what we need to do is we need to, yeah, really think about how to simulate uh, a production process and in particular in more complex industries as in semiconductor where I'm most uh, of my time uh, involved in. It's a, it's a challenging process. I mean, process simulation has been studied since decades, but uh, until now, I think in particular in, in very complex front end productions in semiconductor, I think it's still a challenging endeavor to come up with a good simulation model. And uh, in order to get there, uh, yeah, you guessed it already, it would be potentially cool to bring, some, bring in something as structured and as elegant as Kotlin to uh, build some support API to describe our system here. Because what we have in place already are ways to analyze the data, to visualize the data, and you know, we just need some way to express the dynamics and the rules that govern uh, such a production process. And in order to explore this idea, um, I've created last, I think, December, was I think my Christmas project. My wife didn't like it, but it was so much fun, believe me. Uh, I created another mm -hmm. uh, project on GitHub uh, called Kalasim, which is a discrete event simulation engine uh, written in Kotlin. And it's really uh, built around the idea that we want to model complex dynamic processes. And it's not just a DES engine, uh, but uh, I really tried to bring in lots of engineering uh, uh, features here, which software engineers would typically love to have. So it's statically typed by design. It provides dependency injection. It has modern persistence, structured logging. It, it's really easy to automate. Uh, and uh, with this, the idea was, OK, maybe with such an API, we could model also our factories. And um, just to go a bit deeper here, so what's, what's in the box is a couple of entities which we can define uh, by providing a generative process description that defines the interplay with other entities. For instance, if I have a tool in, uh, on the shop floor, which uh, it could be one entity, and then I have the operator operating the tools, the operator could be another uh, entity. And then I could have more and more entities. And a, uh, um, the task for the modeler here is really to rather define the interplay and to not think so much about the technicalities when building this, uh, the, the model of this process. And this interplay can uh, have different shapes and flavors. So there's a rich vocabulary, including uh, hold, request, and wait, and passivation, which are well-known concepts in discrete event uh, simulation frameworks. And the core of the system is a so-called event trigger queue, which maintains future actions and really drives simulation progress. And um, to, to put, put a bit more meat on the subject, uh, let me show you a first example how we can build a process simulation here, which uh, where we introduce also the key types. So there's actually just three different types of, of entities in, a, in a, even a complex simulation. So there's a so-called component, which is uh, an entity which has a life cycle definition. So there's some kind of process definition associated to it. Like in this example, we have a car. The car is a component. And the car has this uh, life cycle definition, which is always called process. And in its process definition, the modeler can uh, instruct the system how the car interacts with the simulation environment. And what we do here is, I think, uh, something very readable. So even if you don't know Kotlin at all, uh, I think you will manage to read the, the, the simulation script after a couple of minutes. So what we do is we request a resource. Here's a resource as a driver. And the resource is something rate limited. So if uh, the, there's just one driver and two cars are requesting the driver, uh, one of the cars will need to wait. Once uh, the driver could be uh, uh, locked into this uh, process, uh, the driver will then actually do the driving. And in DS terms, this just means we wait a couple of ticks uh, in simulation time until the driving is completed or we hit a traffic light. And in this case, a traffic light is not a resource because there could be multiple cars in front of a traffic light, but it's a so-called state variable, which is the third um, main component here because the state variable has a different, has a discrete set of states. And here we can actually force this process definition to wait until a certain state has, uh, um, uh, has been activated. And this model up here just defines the entities. So we have a resource 
we have a state and you have a single component in this example. And down here, we actually build this and run the simulation. We uh, do the wiring, so we make sure that the traffic light and the driver are accessible uh, to the simulation context. Then we instantiate a single car and then we run it for a couple of ticks. So that's the a core idea of how the system works. And if you peek a bit under the hood, um, we see uh, that, uh, I mean, yeah, let's just recapitulate the, the, the process uh, on a more technical level to really understand what's going on. So it's not that we do threading here. So it's not uh, that we have multiple threads, one for each component, and then they somehow compete for resources. It's there's a so-called priority queue, uh, which is processed in a single threaded manner to uh, process the individual interactions uh, as we define them in our model. And the way it works is if we hold in the simulation, it will calculate the time uh, when this component needs to come back to life and we inject uh, this uh, customer into the priority queue. And the priority queue also so the core engine, we simply consume this queue from uh, top to bottom. And once it has uh, arrived at the customer at time 28, it will reactivate this process definition. It will continue execution of this process definition until it hits another barrier where it needs to wait. So here it needs to wait for some resource. So it again goes to the queue until the resource becomes available and comes back once we have it. And uh, that's essentially how you write a simulation model here. And to be honest, I still find it kind of magical that it works. And please don't ask me about how it technically works because as you see here by these small icons, it's using something which is baked deeply into the Kotlin platform, which is called suspendable coroutines. So you can write functions that are suspendable by design and somehow Kotlin takes care of it to interrupt execution, do something else and then come back without doing multiple threats. So I find it, Amazing, but I'm actually not so much a technician that I could explain you the, 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 the underpinning framework so well, but it works. So there's a, a, a I mean, extensive suite of tests. So we are using it in, in various projects and uh, I still find it pretty amazing that we can stop execution, put it somewhere and come back later on when the time has come. So I, I really like the concept and I hope you agree that it makes it very easy to write down a process definition because we really just have to think about uh, our real world process and map it to these three elements. You need to map it into components of life cycles, to states and to resources. And with this, we can build uh, rather complex simulation models, but you still may ask the questions, what, why on earth did he create another DES engine? I guess uh, you at Casus, you know simulation because it's also, I guess, in, in, to some extent in your work, an important tool to describe system behavior. And there's quite a few uh, frameworks already out there which are well maintained where there's really friendly communities around them. Like there's Simma, there's Salabim, SimJulia, SimPy, these are just to name a few. And for sure there's also commercial vendors like AnyLogic, Simio, uh, just to name a few. But uh, in, in my experience, they still fall short because they are either dynamically typed so you cannot really scale your system description or uh, yeah, with the UI, I don't like it in general. I mean, it's nice to see picture, but it also doesn't scale if I have to drag boxes around. So that's what was really was motivating uh, myself to come up with a novel approach here to, uh, to, 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 to do DES, uh, where we use Python, where we really use this uh, Kotlin really as an integration, as an interface between different teams, because if I just live in my data science bubble, I really struggle to do with my software colleagues and the, the, the data engineers. So by using a common interface here, we can also much easier interact and embed our solutions into higher level architectures. And does it work? Uh, so uh, unfortunately I cannot share most, the most exciting things we do because yeah, we do it for customers. I don't want to see it in public. But yes, it works. So we can actually model semiconductor processes and also other processes very efficiently, also at scale. We can uh, reproduce sensible dynamics. So here you see a schedule of a small fab. We can uh, get a kind of realistic, uh, I mean, for sure we have to design it, but we get realistic uh, um, trajectories and all the key metrics which we are analyzing. We get good uh, whip maps. So I think, yeah, it's really on a good track here. 
uh, clearly, I don't want to dive with you into the semiconductor, pro uh, semiconductor pro uh, production process today, but I thought uh, I've talked for so long, it's time to get some real good food together with you. And uh, it's not just uh, you and me to get some food, uh, good food, but I thought we should also invite some uh, additional colleagues here. So let's have some food with some great philosophers, uh, if you don't mind. And uh, it's in one of the examples which we prepared uh, for Kalazim. It's, uh, you can also find it in the repository and uh, let's just dive into the use case. So what's, what's the problem here, which we want to model and which we want to simulate. So let's uh, um, assume that we have a small table with four philosophers and yeah, there's four forks and uh, typically the philosophers will think and then they will get hungry. They will pick up a fork and uh, they are not able to eat with one fork. So they must wait until the fork uh, on the other side also becomes available. And once they have access to both forks, then they can start eating for a while until uh, yeah, their stomach is uh, filled again. They will put down both of the fork and then they will start thinking again. So that's the use case. And the question is, how can we actually model this uh, in a simulation system? Um, yeah, so here we have so the process definition again. So we just spend random time on thinking. They take one fork. Uh, after some legs, they take the other fork and uh, then they eat. And afterwards, they put down both of the forks. And how would you could then model such a system with the ColorSim API? And let's just look at the, the um, repo documentation and I will walk you through it. But afterwards, let's just do it interactively. I think this should really also uh, be a good opportunity where we can do some live coding together if you want to, uh, where we will then interactively uh, refine this example. So how does it work? So if we need to define the entities in our model and clearly we have these philosophers and we have the forks. So the forks are rate limited. So they're resources and actually we need one resource between each pair of um, uh, philosophers. So what we need to define is a fork as a resource and we need the philosopher as a component in the simulation with some exponentially distributed thinking and eating times. And then we need a process definition. So until eternity, because they are philosophers, they will first do some thinking exponentially, exponentially distributed and then they will pick a fork. And by design, they will always pick the left fork. They will take a breath and then they will uh, picks the right uh, fork. And clearly, since the fork might be in use, we use this resource model here. So we request from the engine, the left fork, which may be unavailable at the beginning. So maybe the philosopher has to wait until this, his uh, left fork becomes available. We will then do the eating. Once we have both of them, uh, we can lock out some events. And, and this is essentially the domain model of this uh, simulation. And now we need to run it. and. How can we actually run it? We uh, create a simulation context. Uh, uh, then we inst instantiate a list of philosophers. Here at Socrates, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle. And then we can build the forks. And we simply make sure that there's uh, one fork in between uh, each pair of them. And once we have uh, created all the forks and the philosophers, uh, we can place the forks uh, between the philosophers and run the simulation for a while. That's essentially the simulation process. And uh, I hope you agree, but I think this also what I would love to discuss with you that this is a rather convenient to way to write uh, system behavior to really model, um, in this case, not so complex system, but nevertheless a complex enough system to uh, uh, so that it's not trivial at all. Um, so that's essentially the process. And later on, for sure, we may want to analyze the simulation so we could pull out some data and uh, then try to build some uh, visualization. And for sure, it's a bit dull to do this here in the, uh, in the, to just read about that in the documentation. So I really want to do this now interactively with you. So let's just uh, do that. So um, unless you have some immediate question. If, if I may just, um, this is also one advantage of Kotlin being like a, a functional programming languages where you can pass easily and pretty intuitive like uh, lambdas um, inside the um, inside as a parameter inside the uh, other functions yes yes that's true <clears throat> but do uh, you have any question or it was just a comment Giuseppe? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, you were muted, but it seemed like you don't have a question. <laughs> Just a comment, uh, because the, this request uh, will be executed uh, later on when available, right? Yes, yes, uh, yes. We, will, we actually will do it right now. So what I want to do now is I start a Jupyter kernel uh, to walk you actually through the example. And uh, so there's this dedicated kernel for, for Kotlin, which I can, oops, now it's, go to went away so quickly. So there's a dedicated kernel which you can simply specify when spinning up Jupyter. And so I uh, to uh, yeah I mean speed up the process so that if we don't get bored, I prepared a workbook uh, like a notebook, but we can evolve it and we will evolve it to make it a bit more useful. So how does it work? Because before in the first mammalian sleep pattern example, we just had a table and then we lo loaded it and we visualized it. Here it's something entirely different. So what we do here is um, we can uh, load the color sim library. So that's all we do. And it takes some seconds. So now it will, I mean, basically warm up its environment. And once this little star has disappeared, yeah, it's all uh, there. And since we are using uh, um, uh, Kotlin, we have to do the import. But I think that's also very common in other languages, like in Python, we would do it. In R, we would do it in a similar way. So we import what we are going to need. And then we do exactly what we just said. We define our simulation entity. So we say we want to use a resource and we want to, we need this uh, philosophers. Every philosopher has a left and a right fork. And then we exactly have the same process as before. And now we really create our entity definitions live. And I think that's already beautiful because now we can also mess uh, around with it. Like if we change our mind and we think, okay, the logging should be a bit different, we can simply reiterate this in an interactive rapid prototyping way. And yeah, so now we have everything we need for the, the domain model and now we can run it. And so let's just walk through what, what's happening here. I think there's one uh, confusing bit maybe, it's called trace collector. Uh, if we include the trace collector, <clears throat> it will, uh, keep a log of all the events that happen during the simulation. It's just the means to do uh, analysis. It's not strictly necessary for running it, but uh, it simplifies as a downstream analysis as we will see. Um, and then we do what we just discussed. So once we have the simulation context, we can define a couple of philosophers. It doesn't need to be four, it could actually be more. <clears throat> Excuse me, Holger, it's my, yes. uh, probably better if you increase the size because it won't be visible on the recording at all. Oh, so, so, sorry. Probably. That's good. Thank good you. idea to invite. Yes, sorry. Thank you so much more. for the comment. Is thank it better you. like this? Um, yes. Yes. Much better. Oh yeah. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> I'm sitting in front of my 4K screen. For me, it's not a problem. But yes, I, I know how it is with remote sessions and the font being way too tiny. Uh, uh, yes. I hope we don't have to start again. Uh, so, so we define the entities um, as we just discussed them before. And now we were. I was just walking you through the, the basic simulation model where we can declare a list of uh, names and then we map this list of names into a corresponding number of forks and we uh, set up the philosophers. And at the very end, we simply run the simulation. And that's also the nice thing. So we can run it and now it has been run. So let's simply uh, add another uh, cell below to see actually well, what, what's happened here. Uh, so we can simply inspect this, uh, the simulation status. So that's basically what we get if we just run this. So it's not so much. So there seems to be five components uh, in the simulation and the event queue, which, which is uh, this queue I explained earlier on the architecture slide contains those four elements. And that's it for now. Um, but what we can now do is uh, we could uh, inspect what's, 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 what's happening here. So we can now actually pull out individual components from the uh, simulations. So we could get a list of all the resource requests. So whenever a fork was requested and map this into a, a data frame, which we can do easily. And then we can look into this and then we can see who has requested what at what time. And we know the state of what, what uh, the entities were doing. And then we can easily use the API that we uh, to, um, discussed before and uh, visualize the data. So we could use the Crevice API to do some kind of timeline um, state visualization where we see where each uh, philosopher is eating and where he's hungry and waiting. And for sure, we can also use other libraries like we could use let's plot uh, and uh, visualize this with the APIs uh, this library provides. I mean, here we just 
for the sake of the example, it's the same plot, but uh, with a different API. So we can really inspect what's happening in the simulation. And if you now go back, I mean, this is a really uh, is a philosopher, uh, philosopher centric visualization, but I guess you are as curious as I about how the forks are actually doing. So let's just dive into a, a particular fork to see how the forks are uh, behaving. So let's jump back to this place where we run the simulation. And I mean, what we did here was um, we inspected the sim itself and let's see whether we can get access to the forks. And unfortunately we can get some, can get some stuff from the simulation, uh, but there's no direct access to the forks, which is a pity, uh, but it's due to the way uh, this system works here. So it's a very simplistic way to define a simulation. If you want uh, type support to uh, use the forks and the philosophers, we need to do it slightly different. And because it's an interactive pro a prototyping environment, we can do so. Uh, so we could say we have a dining table, which is a, a simulation class. And uh, we would change this bit over here and say it's a simulation environment. And, and then we can try to run this and this will fail uh, because it doesn't, it won't compile as such. We need to redo it slightly. Uh, oh, let's see how the compiler error looks like here. Uh, what we actually need to do is we need to build a regular, we may need to work out a regular Kotlin class definition from uh, this one uh, where we say, okay, we have a class. The class has a uh, different um, uh, member attributes here it's the forks. I mean, the names are probably are private. So nobody outside the simulation should uh, care about the, um, I don't know what's, what's, why is it compiling for so long? Let's do this. Uh, uh, okay, well, why, while you are restarting the thing, it's actually, there are ways to access the uh, inner state of the core team. Uh, it, you can do it without creating a new class and you can contact me later I'll explain how to do it. Yes, but in this particular example, that's, I think that's very technical now, but uh, let me check out oh, the zoom bar is in the way. Uh, can I move it? So if we do it like this, um, like, like we do it here, we don't declare an own type. So on the, we, we always get back a type, uh, the, back the type of uh, environment. That's, that's basically what we get. We get an instance of a simulation environment. And so we will never ever be able to access the, the fork variable here. That's why we need to define own type if you want to really uh, enable a type API for our small use case here. So it's not about coroutines here. It's really about yeah, uh, accessing member variables. Does this make sense or should we elaborate this a bit further? Okay. So uh, you, cannot, you cannot access from within uh, the simulation. Oh, uh, we, will be, we will be able to do so in a second. I will, I'm just reworking it. So there's a way it's done here. Here we essentially just create an instance of type environment and then we do some bits within the environment but we don't declare our own type. So that's why we cannot access forks later on when having a handle to this uh, ZIM um, um, variable. And now I'm just reworking it to make it better typed. Uh, and we can simply do so by uh, declaring an own simulation type called dining table, where we then have regular class variables like the forks. And if you wanted to also the philosophers. And uh, with this, we can then, um, access, as you can see in a second, uh, can then access the, uh, the, uh, the, oh yes, we haven't instantiated it. So now we need to declare it. So we have a dining table. We can build a dining table. And now let's see what we get from the dining table. Now you can see something as, uh, which I wanted to show you here. So the Jupyter kernel now provides us completion for the variables within our simulation. And that's essentially what, the, what I wanted to achieve here. So I slightly reflect that the, uh, the very basic uh, simulation into a more 
structured one. So we defined an own uh, simulation type called dining table, which we can instantiate. We can now get access to the forks and the forks, uh, as we just learned, let's just look into the forks, there's four of them. So let's uh, pick out one, uh, there's one fork. And as we've learned, the forks are um, a resource. So we can actually check how the resource is doing. And uh, the way we can do this in, in color sim is, let's just uh, go into the documentation. If we have a resource, uh, there is a so-called uh, monitor associated to it, which we can inspect. Uh, and for sure, we may want to visualize this. And there are different backends. And we can use the uh, let's plot this uh, backend here in our example to visualize uh, um, the state so let's import this and then we can display it and then we can see what we get and this doesn't work why is it not showing it oh front and not defined okay let's do something Ah, okay. Maybe I have to say use. Uh, use. Oh, this needs to go into the cell, I guess. Yes. So I guess I, I forgot to um, uh, import the library, which worked. And now I can uh, actually uh, visualize the claim monitor. And yes, this looks good. It looks very boring at the moment, but it makes total sense because all we've done is we declared the sim we, we defined a simulation type. Uh, we declare we, we instantiated it, but we haven't run the simulation. So that's clearly something which we need to do. So we, we can uh, run the simulation, run the simulation. And uh, we do so by simply saying sim, and again, we should get completion. So there are different ways we can run it until a certain time or uh, just for some text. So let's say we want to run it for 100 units. And so we do so. So we see now the simulation time has progressed. And if we now would uh, visualize the claim monitor of the fork, we actually can see how often this um, fork has been claimed and uh, how often it's under full utilization. And that's essentially what you do when you build simulation models. You need to inspect your individual entities to check whether, uh, whether they're rate limiting, how their processes are doing. You want to inspect the, the, the timeline uh, about well, what's happening in the simulation. And I think with the system as it is already now, we have a beautiful tool now because you can very interactively define a model. We can run the model in place. We can also refine it in place. And we can then introspect it uh, in, in various ways. So I'm just scratching the surface here. So we looked into one of the monitor types for the resources. And we looked into some way to pull out uh, events from the simulation to build this state timeline plot. But for sure, that's just a, one way to do it. And if you would have some interest or time, just go through the, uh, the documentation where uh, we try to uh, detail out other and, and more ways to dig into the dynamics uh, of what's happening within such a sim model. All right, so this was uh, the coding part. I hope this was not too confusing. I, I think it was a bit dense in particular if we haven't worked with the language yet, uh, but I hope I could give you some glimpse about how we can use the, 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 the models which we have discussed earlier, like the Krangel library for um, for, for table manipulation, the crevice library for visualization, and now ColorSim for modeling, how we can bind them together into a single a system to uh, a model more complex processes. I mean, and for sure, this is made up example. I mostly spend my time uh, with uh, modeling manufacturing processes, but I think it's a generic framework, so we could basically model whatever we like. And in the repo, you also find other examples from epidemiology and uh, also more classical scheduling examples if you're interested in. So yeah, um, it's it's all on GitHub if you have some time and some, some interest here. All right, uh, last thing I wanted to do before we close this uh, example. May, uh, may I ask just a question? Sure, um, please. Is the simulation always uh, like a reproducible or deterministic? Also, if it's run on other system, on other 
Yes. Say un yeah. Def okay. Def yes, uh, it is unless you start using the uh, the Kotlin or the JVM random generation, which is not. Yeah. I mean, you have to see that, but uh, the, the simulation comes with some tooling. Like if you do this exponential, there's also other distributions. This is bound to the simulation context, and this is fully mm -hmm. deterministic. Yes. Okay. Which is a very important uh, thing because if if you go uh, for this complex, uh, wait, let's say. If you go to into this factory simulation, yeah. I very often want to trace individual events and to understand why they are happening. And without determinism in the simulation model, this would be impossible. It's a nightmare. Yeah. It's a nightmare. No, no, it's fully deterministic. Mm. Cool. And, and I think this is also because it's not multi-threaded. I think the second you add multi-threading, it becomes very challenging to get determinism here. I mean, mm. I know some vendors provide this, but I think it's very challenging and uh, so far, I haven't encountered the need for multi-threading here because the simulation is really, I mean, it scales with the process definition. So when they get more complex, for sure, you spend more time in, in, in running the simulation loop, but it's not a war time. You always uh, just use this the simulation clock, which progresses not linearly, but you can actually jump. So you jump from T12 to T20. So there's no need to wait. So you can actually build rather complex simulations before you uh, before the simulation consumes actual mm. war time. So even with more complex factory simulations, like when I simulate a year or two, uh, like with hundreds of tools and thousands of lots uh, traversing complex routes, it takes a couple of seconds at max to build to work out the simulation. Totally acceptable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted yeah. to say that uh, we are not working on the discrete simulation. We are working on uh, continuous simulation, which take much more time. And we are actually using multi-threaded environment and there are tools to make a random generator reproducible across coroutines in multi-thread uh, multi environment. This is, mm -hmm. the, the, I think, unique to Kotlin coroutines, actually. Okay, yeah, good to know. Yeah, as I said, at the moment, I didn't see the need to go multi-threaded here because if it scales to a semi-fab uh, and I can do a one year of a semi-fab in a couple of seconds, uh, yeah, I, for me, that there's no use case at the moment to, to scale it better or to use throw in more engineering to allow for even a, a bigger scale. Yeah. Um, so let's let's quickly come back. Yeah, I wanted to close the loop actually. Uh, so because now we worked out the simulation model and uh, when, when talking to you, Giuseppe, in preparation, you also mentioned that you're doing HPC and you throw things to the cluster and then you run it a billion times. And clearly, it could well be that once we have established a model, we also want to run it uh, on a cluster like a gazillion times. And uh, this is now also possible because now we can actually come back to the beginning of the presentation where we talked about this uh, scripting automation uh, with using case script. And what we can do is we can simply uh, define our simulation, or oh, I have to increase the font size again. Wait a sec, wait a sec, view. There's some kind of presenter mode. Maybe I can find this. Yeah, double um, double shift and then type uh, present mode and it should appear. Present, uh, enter, oh, yeah, enter presentation, presentation yeah. here it is. See what happens. Uh, yes. Okay. So what we can do, we can say I create a case script uh, where I declare the dependencies which I need, like Kalasim and Krangle, and then I do the same thing as we just discussed. I define my my model. I define my simulation. I do some analytics, and at the very end, because I want to go to an HPC cluster, I write out some result files, which I then want to analyze later. It's not part of the example here. But this is essentially the simulation model, which I now want to automate somewhere. And because of case script, it's pretty uh, fairly easy to do so. So let's just pretend, oh, now I have to exit the, the presentation mode. Uh, so let's, uh, ah. So let's pretend that uh, we are happy with our simulation model. And now we want to, uh, we, we send it to colleague. Uh, so this script we send to colleague and now he wants to run it. So we go into a virtual machine, which I have just prepared uh, in advance. So it's, it's a different computer. 
it's a, um, a Linux machine, or I have to also work on the UI so that you can see it from remote. Wait a sec, I can do that. Settings. I think there's some kind of scale parameter. We can see fine. I Oh, but uh, I just want to make sure that you can read the fonts uh, scale. You can increase the resolution maybe. Yes, yes, there's this, uh, no, it's UI, I think. No, no, there's, there's a UI, uh, UI. What is it called? I thought it's called scale. You can do this under the monitors um, tab. Monitors, keyboards, or whatever appearance, appearance. Is. Yeah, yeah, where, where do you see the screens? This place, maybe this, yeah, here it is. So I can scale to 200%, that's what I want to do. Yes, I hope it's much better now, isn't it? Um, yeah. Beautiful. So what I did, I've prepared the script and we sent it to a colleague. And uh, so the colleague is on an HPC cluster, for instance, and uh, let's speed up the process a bit. So the colleague has deposited uh, the script, which I just showed you. Uh, and uh, in, in the local file system, uh, and then he can open it. He has no clue about whatsoever Kotlin is, but let's pretend that he has installed or she has installed KScript on his machine. And then what we can do now is we can, uh, because we can also flag it as an executable file, we can simply uh, run it. And because now it will use KScript as an interpreter, we resolve all dependencies, run the simulation, uh, write out the CSV file with the simulation metrics after some seconds. And uh, then, uh, yeah, we are, we are good to go. So, and I think with this, we can uh, really also use this, this Kotlin scripting to really, yes, now you can see it's, it's running the simulation. Let's increase the, the bit. So here is actually showing us the simulation log, which we can always do if you want to. So you can actually read about what's happening, who's requesting what, talking to what other entity. Then at the very end, uh, it has uh, written the sim CSV. So there should be some CSV file, which is called dining. And now we could take this into Python, dplyr, or whatever we like um, in order to do some uh, follow-up analytics after we scaled out the simulation one. All right, and I hope with this uh, final example, I could also uh, illustrate how we can then uh, go back and use this automation capabilities to really bring this uh, combined uh, model, which includes some data science elements, but also some modeling elements into a coherent reproducible workflow. And yeah, so that's basically what I wanted to show. Let's go back to the final summary and recap slides. So da -da -dum. Let's open this. So yes, yeah, so we talked now about the philosophers, uh, refine the uh, example, automate the process so that we could even put it on a cluster or wherever we want to, made it reproducible. So I think, yeah, we, uh, at least I hope you got some idea about uh, how we can model systems with this API here. And uh, so let's uh, sum up my presentation. So uh, for sure, it's a very personal view. So where is it going uh, with, with Kotlin in, in science? So I personally think it's an amazing language for modeling and prototyping. And there's also great new initiatives like there's Kotlin DL for, for deep learning. There's high dimensional areas in Multic. And for me, my personal all time favorite is for sure the Kotlin Jupyter kernel, which is really an amazing tool to, to do prototyping. And uh, by, by using these libraries, which we have discussed here, it becomes really very convenient and a lot of fun to do so. Um, in total, I still think that the tooling barrier is uh, a bit, often a bit too high for, uh, let's say, regular data scientists, uh, but it's very easy for developers. So, I mean, when, when teaching colleagues in-house here at Systema, I think it's very streamlined to onboard them into the platform. But uh, I think in generally uh, the, the data science community has been kind of slow adopting this new tooling because it's a bit more engineering heavy compared to Python or to, to R. But uh, on the other hand side, it's, it's very close to the industry and, and, and big architectures and solution and with this multi-platform approach of Kotlin and the huge JVM ecosystem, I think it's, uh, there are many opportunities to, to build very interesting solutions here. And yeah, so I want to thank in particular uh, 
my company Systema uh, for, for supporting this talk uh, from their end today, where we make industry 4.0 with a lot of love. So we do different topics uh, covering integration, automation, optimization, visualization, and also some brownfield migration projects. And uh, as you probably have heard in the news, I mean, chips are a very rare product at the moment. So, and this means for us, we do very good business. Uh, and so for sure, this means we are hiring at the moment. So just in case your research contract runs out or could run out somewhere, uh, yeah, please come to us. So we do lots of different pro uh, projects, including process analysis, modeling, we do scheduling AI, which we haven't talked about it today at all. Like we do lots of anomaly detection, reinforcement learning, regression type of analyses. There's also factory physics and industrial engineering, which is very important to us and our partners. And clearly the whole thing needs to be built with software. So we have lots of opportunities to build software in Java, Python, C Sharp, SQL, and more odd languages. And uh, clearly since a lot of data is gathered in, in modern manufacturing environments, in a particular and semiconductor, we also rely a lot on big data tooling for Spark, Kafka, Elastic Cloud, and related BI stuff to, to work on this fascinating real world problems in, in different manufacturing industries. So yeah, so all my HR colleague asked me to mention that we offer permanent contracts, which we do. Uh, I have one and uh, yes, you could get one as well. We also provide individual development plans, benefits, and it's not just permanent contracts. So we also love to work with students. So if you or some friend or colleague of you is looking for um, a thesis project or wants to become a work student, yeah, please also get in touch. All right, and that's from my side. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining today. It was for me a great opportunity. I feel really honored uh, talking in front of you today. If you want to get in touch, uh, which uh, I would love, uh, please use email, um, GitHub, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Uh, but for sure, we can also use the local Dresden community uh, to provide some, uh, yeah, to have some beer um, somewhere soon. <laughs> Thank you very much.